<clears throat> well, uh, I think Darren deserves a round of applause for keeping us on time this morning. So can we give it up for Darren? <clears throat> That's no small task, given what we've just been through. <clears throat> um, you have to forgive my voice a little bit, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'll do everything I can to make it, uh, to make it as clear. Uh, I have just come off the back of uh, Nashville, Hawaii, and then the Awakening Crusade in Brisbane. And, uh, and just for some reason now, my voice has decided to give up after all of that. But um, I feel great, right? And that's what matters. I can't believe how many friends I've got here this morning. Like, I didn't know what I was turning up to. And like half of the room I already know, which is, uh, which is a really big blessing to me. I'm going to basically... Um, trying to keep this pretty high level when it comes to the things of the kingdom uh, and to, you know, it, like trying to embed the kingdom uh, into the business world. That's literally uh, what keeps me up. Like the, being able to put those two together uh, is, uh, is the assignment that is on my life, uh, or at least one of them. If we can go to the next slide, Charlie, that would be amazing. Uh, this is my beautiful family. Um, my wife, Kimberly, there, uh, she's the second best thing that's ever happened to me after becoming a believer. Um, so interesting, Kimberly has been very political for the last bunch of years and at the last New South Wales council election uh, was voted to the Tweed Shire as, um, as a councillor, which is really good because now we have at least one person with some common sense in the Tweed Shire. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, it's currently sitting at two years to get a DA for a swimming pool in our area. So uh, it'll be good to have somebody with a little bit of get up and go to put a rocket up them, right? And then, uh, and then I've got three daughters. I'm not sure what the Lord's trying to show me there, but I'll figure it out probably after they've got married. So the oldest one, Charlie Grace, she's with me in the room. Uh, the middle one, Harper Lily, and the little one that looks like a pirate, that's Scarlet May. And, uh, and they are my absolute treasure. Uh, yesterday, uh, we all went camping. Uh, I set them up down at a campsite, and then I changed out of my board shorts and came up here to be with you. And the second that this finishes, I'll be heading straight back to go camping with those guys for another, for another few days. But, you know, it's, it hasn't always been all rosy and a nice picture. Like, if I was to weave my testimony into this morning, you know, I grew up, um, you know, I, my father left home on my eighth birthday, um, which, I mean, I mean that'll, that'll wake you up when you go to your mum. There's a few friends over for your party and you go to your mum, where's dad? Oh, he left. He left tonight. And, uh, you know, and, and, and growing up in a home where they wanted to look like everything was good, but behind the curtain, it was a disaster, right? And so as soon as I could kind of get out of that life, I, I did. Um, my mother went on to meet somebody else. He's an incredible man. They, they still live together. We emigrated from London to Australia in 1993. And you come to Australia and you know nobody, right? And so there's, there's quite a lot of things you have to navigate through that period of time. And I had no faith to fall back on. And it wasn't actually until I got to 24 years old when I was searching for, I guess, meaning. I was looking in all the wrong places for meaning, this one young girl said to me one day, you should come to church. That was it. That was the line. You should come to church. I was like, okay, I will. And so I went to Logan Uniting Church, all right, which some of you may know. Um, and I walked in that place and I got to experience the love of God with never seeing him face to face. It was just an environment that was so beautiful that I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? Now I stood at I sat at the back of church, you know, like I had my game face on, you know, like I was steely, you know, but I was falling apart on the inside the first time I ever went to church. Anyway, church finished that night. Um, they didn't do altar calls. I don't know whether they've just given up or whatever, but um, <laughs> that was my best joke and you didn't even laugh. All right, so we got, we got some trouble here this morning. 168 hours later, I couldn't wait to get back into church. And I went back the next week and sat in the back and listened to the message. And they didn't do an altar call. And I went home that night. And I threw myself down on the floor in my bedroom. And this was the 23rd of September, 2004. So I've just had my 20th birthday as a believer. And, uh, and I thank God for all of that. And, and it was really interesting, right? Because nobody gave me a Gideon's. It would have been helpful if they did. So I, I remember I became a Christian. I was like, I don't even have a Bible. So we went down to the bookstore and we went and bought one. And I was committed. I was reading and reading and reading as much as I possibly could about the scriptures. 
and my world fell apart because it was the exact opposite of the world that I'd been living up to that point. So just to weave another element to the story, I came to Christ at 24, but I started business at 19. So at 19 years old, I'm running businesses, right? And, and, and between that day and today, I have built and sold 11 companies. So I was a non-believer running businesses, and I assumed that the role of business in my life was to give me everything I wanted. If I wanted a bigger house, I built a bigger business. If I wanted another toy, I just built a bigger business. If I wanted a boat, built a bigger business. That was the role that business played up into my life, right up until that moment where I bought a Bible and I started reading about what God, how God wanted me to trade and how God wanted me to handle my life. And man, I had a decision to make. Was I prepared to lay down my former ways and pick up the new ways? You know, just an example would be I started reading about the gleaning principle. Do not go over the corners of your fields twice. Leave that for the poor and the, the needy. Huh? What are you talking about? Business is all about me, right? Jubilee cycles, how to handle debt, trade in seven-year cycles, right? You can borrow and trade from each other, but there's got to be a point where there's a debt clock gets reset back to zero, right? So I'm reading all of this going, man, but I thought business was debt on debt on debt. So my world was falling apart, and I had to make a decision. Was I going to learn God's way of doing this thing, or was I not? So three weeks after coming to Christ, I'm in the backyard of the house. It was an afternoon. I'm reading my Bible, and I yell out to the Lord. I say to the Lord, I've spotted the racket. In other words, I've spotted the trend, because I'd been to church three times at this point. <laughs> <laughs> And I said to the Lord, I said, these people are beautiful people, but they know when to sit down, when to stand up, when to clap, when to smile, and when to drink coffee. And I said to the Lord, honestly, I said, if that's all this is, you won't keep me. I actually said to the Lord, what the world has to offer is better than church attendance. You better show me the assignment on my life. If I'm laying it down for you, there needs to be some tangible fruit. Over the next few days, he showed me that I would one day start a training academy for Christian entrepreneurs, which made me really happy because I loved business and I loved the kingdom that I just found out about. But it freaked me out because it was quite a big assignment. So I slipped that in my back pocket. I, I figured I'd better go figure out who he is. Um, and then in 2012, uh, the, the law, I, I was quite frustrated in my businesses in 2012. They were very, very profitable. Uh, things were going incredibly well. I'd won all the industry awards for the, for the business I was in, but I was unfulfilled. And in my going back to the Lord, the Lord showed me that I needed to start the assignment that he told me right back in the beginning. And so in 2012, we ran our first Kingdom Business Summit. And that was just three words that I put together because it was like, run a conference for Christians in business. That was it. It's funny, he, I, I felt those words to run a conference for Christians in business and then I went back to him for all the details and it was like crickets. It's like he had moved. Like he, he had nothing else to say to me, right? Which really frustrated me for a period of time until I realized that all he wanted me to do was run a conference for Christians in business, right? So he's like, I'll tell you after you've done that one. So I hired a hall down in Narang, and the reason why it was in the rang was the cheapest hall I could find, right? Uh, because the model was is that I was paying for this. This was a, this was a me using my gifts and talents to, to put on an event for two days at my expense to invite people, you know, to, to start this journey. And I remember it well. We had 28 people in the room in 2012. And, uh, and at the end of those two days, you know, we kind of went back to people and said, like, was it good? Like, did you enjoy it? And they said it was profound. So... We did it again the next year, and, uh, and, and the numbers, numbers have gone, I guess, well um, since then. You know, we, uh, we went from, from 28, next year we had 96, then we had 194, 450, 997, and the numbers exploded. We went to multiple cities. We were doing five summits in five weeks in a row around the country, uh, and then COVID hit. So interestingly, I was halfway through a national tour uh, when, when, when we were shut down. Now I only run the Kingdom Business Summit in one city, and that one city is Brisbane, and I do that because I want to stay married, right? <laughs> well, for those of you who have paid alimony, it gets expensive after a while. So, um, 
So now we run an event and we will hold it again in March. In fact, it'll be March 27 to 29 at the Royal International Convention Center, the RNA. Um, and we will have something like 750 to 800 kingdom entrepreneurs in the room for two and a half days, teaching them how to practically grow a business and, and, and build their faith. So that's cool. And we just launched in the US, which is, which is why I sound terrible. Um, so all of that to say, right, that, that I believe that if every kingdom entrepreneur on this planet decided to lay their life down and seek first the kingdom of God, we would turn the marketplace inside out in no time. I, I feel like if we are going to touch the fabric of this nation, we cannot do it without touching the business world. If, if you look at corruption, corruption is created at its core in the marketplace. It then flows out to government and then it flows out from there, right? So if we're going to actually, you know, kind of make an impact into this country, we're not going to do it without going into the marketplace, right? Coming to the marketplace in the opposite spirit and trading God's way. And if we do that, it'll be like a little bit of leaven that is uncontrollable through the marketplace. And that will be the largest mission ground over the next however long period of time if we can get enough Christians bold enough, secure in their faith, to go do it. Yeah? yeah. Wow, okay. All right, you need a second coffee? Is that, is that what you need? <laughs> and so that's quite a big task, right, to, to, to view it that way. But actually, all we need to do as individuals is just choose to lay down our own life, lay down our own agendas, work really, really hard, and the favor of God is going to be applied to everything that we do. That's going to be the difference maker. Our job is not to take on the entire marketplace, right? Our job is just to use the gifts and talents and time that we were given and, and go and work incredibly hard, right? And so I'm going to take us through what I call the five hallmarks of a kingdom entrepreneur. But of course, you know, if you're running a, a not-for-profit, it's the same thing. It, you know, the only difference between a not-for-profit and a for-profit is ASIC, right? Like, we're still trying to achieve something great, like bring in revenue, have some impact, hopefully make a profit and then redeploy it. We're, we're all trying to do the same thing in that sense, all right? So I'm going to run through those, those five hallmarks. If we can go there, Charlie, that'd be great. I'm going to do them quickly. Number one, just pop the next slide up. I think that your business is actually your ministry, and I do not see a distinction between the two. Your business is your ministry. I want to actually break down some of the mindsets around this so that we, we like to see Christianity in little boxes, but it's not, right? It's the kingdom of God that we all come under. Come so I think we've done a brilliant job of putting the, um, the preacher pastor up on a pedestal and the Sunday expression of the church on a pedestal that we've neglected the rest of the world. Right? And, and here's the cool thing. There's no hierarchy or pecking order of calls in the body of Christ. What, you know, so, so a pastor doesn't carry a greater anointing than a business person. Uh, well, they do as long as they use their anointing where they're called to use their anointing. That's where your anointing is strongest, right? So if you ask me to go and be a pastor on a Sunday at church, it's not going to go well. Right? But if you ask a lot of pastors to go and be a business person in a boardroom in a hostile environment, it's not going to go well, right? Because we are anointed to be where we're called to be. But the way I look at it, right, is the pulpit at church on Sunday, that's no more godly than my boardroom on a Tuesday, right? So we actually have to break down a lot of these separators and see them for what they are. Now, here's the really cool thing for business people. If you take your team or your staff you get to spend 40, 50 hours a week with them, investing in them. Not 90 minutes on a Sunday. 40 to 50 hours a week, you're rubbing shoulders with your customers, your suppliers, right, your team, and, and really kind of out there giving people an expression of the kingdom of God. See, ultimately, we're all going to give an account for our gifts and talents. Paul talks about in Scripture the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to, we're going to give an account at the judgment seat. Now, it's not a judgment against sin. That's already paid for. It's the best deal ever. But it is a judgment against, did you, how did you use the time and the, the talents and the treasure that you were given while you were here? Right? So what we can't afford to do as business people is shrink back and say, 
Well, that's ministry and mine's business. I mean, why would you put six days as non-godly in your calendar and then one godly day? It doesn't make any sense, all right? So as a kingdom entrepreneur, I'm looking for that one opportunity, that meeting with the staff member that's going through some challenges. I want that period. I want that moment, right? Because that's my opportunity to speak into their life, right? When things are going wrong, it's a wonderful opportunity to be a minister. When you make a great profit, it's a wonderful opportunity to be a minister, all right? Because you can show your allegiance to the Lord by saying it's not all about me. So we have to break down these these barriers. Charlie, let's go to number two. I feel like you should build a bigger business than you need out of duty. One of the modern things that a lot of people do is, is they, well, they start out with a big passion, right? Like I want to, I want to build a big business, but because, bu- because building a business is so difficult, so long and so hard, their vision just comes down and down and down and down and down over the years because it just seems so far away. And what they do is they end up bringing it right down to where they are comfortable. Listen, if a Christian decides to go into the marketplace and they only build a business big enough that it can fund their life, then how is that any different to the world? Like we're supposed to be selfless. It is selfish to grow a business to the point where you get what you want. It is selfless to keep using your gifts and talents to go bigger than you need so that you can actually impact more people and write bigger checks. Right? That's harder. But at that point in your entrepreneurial life, when you've laid down your own agenda and you're doing it for the kingdom, that's the kind of kingdom entrepreneur that heaven can back that's the, that's the kind of kingdom entrepreneur that heaven can put a lot of resources in your hands because those resources will drive you towards God and not away from Him. All right? But it's about paying a price. And if our mindset is, I will work hard for a while and then I'll get a caravan and blow my kids' inheritance, if that's the thinking, that's not kingdom. All right? King, kingdom is... Till, the, till your very last breath, you are fighting for the things of the kingdom. So, so if that's the case, and you're called to business, you should never stop. You should never, ever stop. The, the, the products and services that you're in right now, the business you're in right now, they can come and go throughout your whole life. But the anointing for business doesn't leave. And so you should be doing that, in my opinion, until the very end. And you're going to make way more profit and wealth creation in the back end of your life than you will at the front end of your life because wealth compounds, right? So that's when you can afford to be making your biggest moves is towards the end of your life. But the whole concept of building a bigger business out of duty starts with a decision of I'm laying down my own life and therefore I'm laying down my ambition. Let's go to number three, Charlie. We have to deny the lust of the flesh as we go through the journey. This is possibly the hardest part of this, right? If you open Instagram or any social media or you look around the world right now, we are bombarded with a million messages of how we should look, how we should dress, what we should wear, what we should buy and where we should be. And and culture is pushing on us so hard that we all should look and be a certain way. Let's, let's, distill though, let's distill all of culture down to um, the things that we know are blingy. Let's go with houses, watches, and cars, right? It's not just those. You know, it's, 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 it's cruises, it's being at events, it's needing a photo with the famous person. It's, it's all the things that culture can push at you. But let's just summarize them with houses, cars, and watches, right? It's like, we, all, we need a house. So it's not that houses are evil. But you've got to ask yourself, why am I pursuing a better and better and better and better one? Why? When you've got a car that's perfectly good, but you want a better and better one, why? It's not the car or the house that's the issue. It's not the watch that's the issue. Why? Is it because your friends have just spent a whole bunch of money on a new car and you want to get it too? Is it because you want to look like you're a successful person? Is the, do you want the watch for the photo? 
See, see, at that point, we've got to ask ourselves the question, well, who's our allegiance to? Is it the opinions of man or is it to the kingdom of God? All right? And remember, it's not about the house. Live wherever you like. But your motivation for wanting it, you have to be super careful about. So you know the scripture about the seeds that fell on different types of ground. One of the seeds fell, right, and thorns grew up and choked it. And the scripture says, the cares of this world and the, uh, the deceitfulness of riches is how it calls it. The deceitfulness of riches. So as a kingdom entrepreneur, that's going to be our biggest enemy. Of all the enemies that we will face, the deceitfulness of riches will be our biggest one. The Bible also refers to it as a spirit of mammon. It's an antichrist spirit, right? You know, if, if you think about a pastor, for example, they're not going to face the spirit of mammon in the same way that an entrepreneur will, right? Because there's not as much money and wealth created. A pastor would have to be able to stand down um, like pride and, and being top dog business person is going to have that one too, right? So if when, when you start to build a business and you get some wealth and everyone tells you you're pretty good at this, you've got to check yourself because that's where the lust of the flesh is going to come in. I like being told I'm great. I like being the person. I like being the man. I like being the woman, right? We have to guard ourselves against that because it will be the thing that takes us out. Charlie, number four. And then you've got to fund your local church. Yeah, fund your local church. Listen, the church is not going to do it by accident, like it needs actual finance. And you can fund a lot of things, but I do believe that you should fund your local church. Now, is there a scripture for that? Yes. If you look at 1 Timothy 5.17, Paul writes to Timothy and says, considering the people that are doing well with the affairs of the church, especially those whose role is preaching and teaching, they deserve double honor. That's what he says. Now, double honor is not you clap them twice as loud or you pat them on the back twice as much, right? <laughs> double honor, if you actually take that scripture and go deeper, is a double financial payment. The, peop the people who are running the affairs of the church and the people who are preaching and teaching should actually be twice as financially blessed as everybody else, according to what Paul wrote to Timothy, right? So we have an obligation to make sure that our people that are running the affairs of the church and preaching and teaching are well funded. Right? Now, by the way, that's not going to come from tithes and offerings. That's going to come from kingdom entrepreneurs who have laid down their own agenda, build a business bigger than they need, and go and back their pastors. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Point number five. And then you've got to learn how to walk in authority. If you don't know how to walk in authority, the enemy's going to come and pick your patch clean. There will be nothing left. And so we all know about the full armor of God. If you've read any part of the scripture and been to church more than nine times, you've heard a sermon on the full armor of God. And I meet a lot of people that say to me every day, oh, I get up every morning, where's, and I put on the full armor of God. And I go, why? The scripture never told you to take it off. So put on the full armor of God and keep it on. But, but what is the sword of the spirit? What's the sword of the spirit? We think it's the word of God. And it is, but it isn't. In Ephesians 6.12, where it talks about the sword of the Spirit being the Word of God, it's the Word of God, but it is the spoken Word of God. It is not the written Word of God. Here's why that's important. When you come up against attack and you want to take authority, if you haven't actually taken the Scriptures and put them inside of you, there's nothing to pull on to speak against the enemy like Jesus did when he was tested. His ability to say, no, no, it was written, was because he knew the Scriptures. So it's going to be very hard for you to have a sword in, in terms of, you know, the warfare if you can't speak out scriptures that you haven't digested. So you've got to get in the word. You've got to build deep wells in your faith with what the Bible says. Then it becomes a sword of the spirit because you can verbally speak out what the scripture says in opposition to the assignment against you. That's where your authority is going to come from. All right, next slide. Here, here's my, here's my, my final remarks. Um, we have developed a culture where we find ourselves waiting on God. I'm in my waiting season. I'm just waiting for a clear message. I just need another prophetic word to line up so that I know what I need to do, right? And yet God, God's not going to play. And he hasn't got another card. There is no next step. He literally, Jesus said, it is done. It is enough. Go and make disciples. What are we waiting for? 
We don't need another green light, right? Another conference, right? The right flag to come out at the next revival meeting. We don't need any of that. What we actually need is people that go, yep, let's go. Let's go into the marketplace. Let's use what's in our hand, right? Let's bring about the kingdom on a daily basis. And that's going to be the thing that becomes catalytic, right? To start to usher in what Billy Graham said was that the next great revival will be in the marketplace. Let me tell you, that is not a revival that is coming. That is a revival that has been happening for the last 10 years. So if you like this, uh, I've got one more slide up, which is our YouTube channel that we run. Um, if you, we, we put out content every single Monday morning across all your podcast platforms. Uh, the organization is called Kingdom Business. You can go there. I've got uh, Virginia from my team up the back there with a few resources. We have literally just this week launched a seven-week Bible study for Kingdom Entrepreneurs where groups and churches can get together, watch the modules, have discussion points, fill in a workbook, and bring some community around Kingdom Business. And it is, it is my absolute commitment to keep fighting the cause of getting entrepreneurs to go into the kingdom and use every single one of their gifts and talents to make a difference. I've loved hanging out with you for these few minutes. If you have questions, I can hang around and answer, uh, and answer them for you afterwards. But good morning. That's awesome, Wes. Do you mind just staying with me for a brief minute? Pretty please. I've got a couple of questions. And if you have a question, please feel free. We've got a few minutes for some Q&A. Um, awesome. Thank you. In all of your experience walking with business owners, and, and everybody here is either an organisation runner or a party to business, what, what would you say is um, one of the key steps for people to step into that authority? Like what's, what's missing for, for many of the people that you, you often see in the marketplace that kind of are a bit oblivious to that? Mm. Well, I, I think it, it, it comes from identity. Like, if you really want to go and be bold in the marketplace, it's going to come from a place of identity. It's not going to come from a place of the right sentence or the right word or you read the right book or whatever. Like, like you will get... Because remember, the enemy knows the scriptures better than we ever will, right? So this is not about you having to say the right sentence at the right time. This is about you just choosing to walk in a victory that already took place. And if you can actually figure out that the cross was not as much to show you your sin as it was to show you your value then you will know what he did for you and you can take that into your everyday. That's awesome, mate. So good. Um, tell me, in terms of um, actual practical business toolkits, coaching from your perspective, if you've helped businesses grow you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. What are a couple of the key catalysts that you work with? Mm. The hard part about doing a 35-minute talk is my shortest seminar is normally 16 hours, right? <laughs> That's the shortest one that we run. So um, my actual day job is not this. My day job is helping people build out marketing campaigns, learning how to sell so they can convert, right? How to employ financial management, reading, PN. Like, that's my day job is to do that bit every single day, which I would with more time. And if you come to the summit, that's what you'll get. If, I, if there's one skill set that is sorely lacking across the body of Christ, it's marketing. Right? You've got the best business, you love your customers, you love, you, you, you've got so much going for you, but no one knows who you are. Right? And that is, it's a shame that you would keep that light under a bushel. Right? So, um, so I would say go and learn marketing. Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, strategic alliances, networking events, cold calling, bold calling. Just start with those seven and your life will look very different in 90 days.